Ah, oh, thank you, Steffi, for the warm-up. Oh, I think it, it worked, and Yossi's speech as well. Marcus, um, we're going to get to speed and scale pretty quickly, but first a little, in German we'd say Lokalkolorit, uh, a bit of a localism here. A well-known manager, Bernd Pischetsrieder, who's actually born in Munich and ran BMW for a while, you know him, he once said, if you want to transform a company, not only do you need time, but you may also need a little crisis. So be careful what you wish for. What we currently see is not just a little crisis, but a massive one, actually multiple ones. Uh, Martin has talked about them earlier, and um, I'm not sure we still have that much time. Judging from what you've seen in Europe, in Germany, during the last months, during the last years, what is, what is your take? Will these crises help or obstruct innovation and transformation? Well, unfortunately, what we've seen in the last two and a half years, this terrible war in the Ukraine that all makes us personally very sad, um, but especially also the corona crisis has shown, it sharpens the focus and shows if things are really urgent and if we really get from the sequential approach to extrapolate and leave all the steps that we normally have in order to decide things and really prioritize on one thing, how fast we could be. I think at least we have shown the potential that sits in us if we really focus on one thing, working from home or getting security and safety for the whole country in the right place. I think that we can be actually really good, that we can be much faster than we, than we thought. And that the things that normally take years could happen in a few days, if we really want and if we really focus. Uh, so from that perspective, the sense of urgency of topics that are really matter to us, um, it shows we can. If we want, we can. Um, I just throw a little salt in that um, positive spirit and, and optimism. Um, you're a single father of two little girls. So could you just share, or let me just ask, how desperate were you at times of lockdown when maybe government um, digitization, etc., did not set the right priorities. So, um, I think your your girls still go to or have just started going to school. You as a single parent, do you, do you actually think that we were up to that at the time? First of all, I learned I'm not a good teacher, as many of us maybe in these times. Um, but from that perspective, I think it was step by step. I think first of all, it was clearly still everybody should stay healthy, but. Once we went into the first lockdown, and then it was try and error. But from that try and error, then in the second lockdown and then the third lockdown, I think there was a, a pattern how we should behave. And then I think step by step, we have shown that it could work. I think our infrastructure, our networks worked. Everybody thought, oh, in Germany, our network's not as good. But finally, we managed the crisis and the stress test of the crisis, we, we fully performed. Clearly. Could things gone better? Not everybody had a device. Not everywhere there was the, um, the content available. Not every teacher was willing to really work in, on digital life. But at the end of the day, I think also what, what we have seen and what we have experienced, it could work. And the vision of a digital country, I think by just by accident we achieved that level, it worked. I think it now went back a little bit. I'm still, my children still now use the, again the, the good old math book. Uh, on an analog way, and we, we lost a little bit of this, um, of this can-do spirit, mm -hmm. as we also have in our company. But from that level, um, overall, it worked out. All right. Um, we, we'll get to what you said, the, the quality of the infrastructure later on. I, I might challenge you on that. Um, let's just stay in Germany for a little while longer, because I think parts of the international audience will be quite interested in sort of how the government is doing after 16 years of, of Angela Merkel. Um, the new coalition started uh, with a very progressive spirit. Um, from, from your take as a, as a manager from the business side, do you think they are delivering on that promise of innovation, transformation, speed, scale? Or will Ukraine and the atrocities there sort of keep up that process Germany sort of desperately needs for the next months or maybe years? First of all, I think let's acknowledge we have the most ambitious climate target in Europe. I think we want to have by 2030 80% of renewable energy. And at the same time, we want to have nationwide fiber and the latest and best mobile coverage. So I think these are statements. So at least we have a vision where we want to target. I think that was missing a little bit in the past. So there's a, will this target be easy to achieve? Not. But if the 
um, two key priorities is climate neutrality and best digital infrastructure, then I think also the country and the companies know where to go for and how to target for. At the end of the day, I think both we need both. It's our we will not achieve our climate targets without the best digital infrastructure because we need to get more efficient, we need to save resources, and all companies built on having digital infrastructure in order to achieve their climate targets. But from the ambition level, I think that we have, I think it's a statement. Clearly, reality rules. This is the, <laughs> is the theme of, of this conference, and also for the new government, reality rules. So the um, the aspiration and clearly the, the strong start that we have seen clearly immediately swapped into uh, the corona crisis popped up again, then this terrible war popped up again. But at least um, there is no excuse not to fully work on the digitalization of the country because whatever we need, we need the digital sovereignty, we need so sovereignty on the, especially on the uh, energy supply side, on many other things. So, I think the ambition level from the crisis we are currently in should even increase uh, with the challenges we see in front of us. Okay. Um, I, I saw on LinkedIn that you met Olaf Scholz recently. I think he came over for the Girls' Day at Telefonica. Yes. So because we are in a very secure and discreet environment, what did you talk about behind closed doors? <laughs> Overall, I think this is a great initiative that is continued also from Ms. Merkel. So I think it's a continuation to bring young girls into technology areas and to make them um, excited about new technologies. And I think um, in order to foster that, I think it's a great initiative. And from that level, I think the key part on that day was clearly um, some uh, uh, daughters of, of some of our colleagues built a, mobile, a small mobile network and they're really showing to the Chancellor how a mobile network basically works with the encryption, with uh, sending and then receiving. So it was, a, was a fantastic possibility to see what is possible and the engagement and, uh, and the passion uh, young girls have for new technology. So it was really all about technology and bringing girls into that. And did you get the impression that the Chancellor has an idea what the metaverse could be and will mean? Well, in these days, hopefully in a metaverse, we will not have a terrible war that we have today. I think um, that's the clear part. We might have other challenges with cybersecurity and other um, threats that might be there. But overall, the vision that Germany and also Europe could be at the forefront of the metaverse, we clearly is a message that we pass on. And um, with the value set that we have created in Europe, we should not wait that somebody else somewhere in the world builds the metaverse. I think the metaverse is a definition that we could experience content and digital life with all senses that we have. And we have all that we need to start it here also in Europe. And we clearly see an openness also from, from the whole government, and, but not only the government, also the lender. For example, also Bavaria is very active in being at the forefront of the metaverse in order to clearly create our own digital uh, sovereignty and to decide about our digital destiny and not wait for someone in the rest of the world to show us the way to the metaverse. I think it could also happen here and this is our duty. We'll get to digital sovereignty later but talking about waiting, uh, there's a wonderful example of someone who didn't want to wait um, for sort of the, the fossilite German administration and the lengths it takes to, to get permits, etc. And that man is Elon Musk, whom, as you know, builds a gigafactory in, in Brandenburg for Tesla, north of Berlin. And he used, well, not a loophole, but a, an option German law gives him, it's completely legit, that allows him to, to build the factory as it is without having the proper permits yet. But should, after the factory is, is, is completed, should the courts decide that something is off, like it's four centimeters too far to the east. Um, he has to dismantle it. And Elon Musk took that option because apparently he thinks he can afford it and Tesla can afford it. But most companies, both in Germany and Europe, um, would still, because they have maybe less impulsive CEOs, um, would rather wait than take the risk of having to dismantle everything. So will that be sort of us being shown by the guys like Elon Musk um, how speed actually works, or as you said, can, can, can Europe do it on its own? So I'm in. I would volunteer also to go down that route. 99.5 of all mobile sites are anyhow permitted. 
we need to wait one and a half or two years for it. But if 99.5, I anyhow get the permission, I would also work with that fiction that I start to build. And so if we're talking about cell, cell towers. Cell towers, So for yes. a cell tower in Germany, yes. you need to wait for a year and a half. Yes, it's, it's incredible. To get the permit, not yes. to build it. And they look the same in Bavaria than in Saxony or in North mm -hmm. Rhine-Westphalia. So it's, it's a very boring thing to build at the end of the day. But it's important because it gives us coverage and digital connection. So how long everywhere. does it take to build? The building, it depends. If I could start to build, I could also build in a complete area. So I now need to wait if I want to cover, for example, the Bavarian forest. It's very closer to here, and I need to build 20 sites. Then I need to wait sometimes four years to get all the permissions. If I could just build and then get the permission later, I could build all 20 sites in half a year. So this is the kind of efficiency we should aim for. Maybe the also minister for is still sitting here with us, um, that smiling. We, that we advocate. <laughs> Clearly, it's a revolution in our building law, but at the end of the day, for the key infrastructure projects, like wind energy that we need, or uh, digital infrastructure, I think we cannot allow to be so slow in some of the processes. So the industry, I think, is ready to take that risk and would also rebuild it on our own cost in case uh, it would not be in line with law. But what Elon Musk has shown to Germany basically is um, we can just do it. And he took the full risk, and if he wouldn't got the permission, then he would have rebuilt. And there are many areas, I think, where we, there should be trust that the industry could deliver, and then we have a parallel process. Today we work sec sequentially, and the sequential approach took years. And we know that to build uh, wind energy took six to seven years uh, for one uh, for one infrastructure, and this is clearly having the target in mind in 2030. There is room for improvement, and we have these are low hanging fruits. It doesn't cost the government anything mm -hmm. to change this process. Um, so, we've talked about the difficulties in Germany. You're not only the CEO of Telefonica Germany, you're also on the executive committee of Telefonica Global, um, which is one of the world's largest tele telecommunication providers. So, what do you think are the best practices you see in the rest of Europe, in the rest of the world, regarding transformation, speed, scale? Well, what we clearly see is in Spain, Spain started in the biggest crisis um, in 2012 to deploy a fiber network. And there was not the real demand from the day one, but they said, in 10 years, we know that we will need fiber. And they started to invest and they build it, and they have now seven or close to 80% fiber penetration. Is the, they have the most, more fiber accesses than any other European countries together. Um, what we also see is this fiction of building permission so that you just build and, 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 and get the permission later is used in many European countries. And also, most importantly, what we also see Spectrum auctions, for example, for already used spectrum. Um, Germany has a, has a bad history on that one. Um, 60 billion of, of, of euros have been taken out of the industry. Other re European countries are smarter on that one. So they just renew and give very tough rollout obligations on it. So the infrastructure, the mobile infrastructure in, in most of the member states has been in the past better. It's now improving in Germany, so we get on the level of state of the art. But clearly going forward, um, if we want to go new ways, I think we should not auction spectrum anymore and clearly give tough rollout conditions because I think we need coverage and no spectrum auctions. Um, reality rules, as DLD says. I remember you saying, I think it was just before Christmas, that there was a lack of courage and a lack of determination. Um, you sound a lot more positive today. Maybe that's the whole DLD climate. Um, what I'm wondering, if we say reality rules, is um, how we can actually talk of digital sovereignty in Europe. The minister just mentioned those buzzwords as well. When we see that 92% or more, at least more than 90% of all data in the Western world are saved on US clouds. Um, when we see that Europe is definitely not on the winning lane regarding the commercialization of artificial intelligence. We have great patents and science and technology is, is, is excellent and impressive, but Quantum, quantum computing, cryptography. But again, investors don't seem to think that they can cash in and all the money is going westwards to, to the US. How will we change that? Well, it's all about digital relevance from our perspective and the value set that we have created. Clearly, the currency currently is data. And giving data away for free and then using services for free has been an established model. But what we clearly see also now in the in the new times that we live in, that data protection and data security really matters to our customers. If we ask our customers trust 
in us that we treat the data um, in, a, in an appropriate and compliant way is a key requirement. And also in this world with more and more cyber crime, I believe that going forward with the value set of the GDPR and the common framework that's across all European countries, that we can make a difference. Up to now, clearly, as you're right, we haven't been able to transform that into digital relevance because the key platforms are not used by us in Europe. And maybe we also have one disadvantage. We do not have a common language in Europe. But with the new possibilities of real-time translation, so that, for example, that the target show could be watched in Portugal in real-time translated, or we can watch Italian uh, news or, or um, um, events, uh, from that perspective, this will help us because going forward, we need to create our, create our own destiny going forward. We cannot only rely on other platforms. And I think also the next generation will ask us, why isn't there a European platform or a platform um, that uses? Because it's not a cost about a platform. The cost to, and we've seen that with TikTok or other services, it's not so, e not so difficult to build a global platform and to scale up in a few months. We need to be int or attractive and um, uh, create a platform from my perspective that on the one side clearly gives transparency what happens with the data, what's, what's about data security and being digital relevant. And we have all the content here in Europe from sports, from uh, music, from news, from broadcasting, I think from education, from culture. So I think to really rethink the idea of a European metaverse, that is really something that drives me and excites me because the technical, it's not a question of money or technical barriers. I think it's really um, is, the, is the willingness to create something that really correlates with our Euro, uh, European values. And it's not about excluding someone. I think mm -hmm. everybody can enter the European um, uh, metaverse. Sure, just let me be the spoil sport. So far, you're talking about sort of a European wide or global data platform, content platform from Europe, but so far we're not even managing to get sort of um, the, your industry, like the, the, the telecommunications industry, as a unified single market. Just an example, I think US serves 380 million um, consumers with three to four telecommunication providers. In China, it's 1.4 billion Chinese who have three to four three, mm -hmm. three telecommunication providers. Um, Europe, 500 million people living here have three to four communication providers as well per country, which means we have 120 altogether. So don't get me wrong, I like competition, but if we don't even manage to have a, a sort of a, a scaled market in Europe for, for your business, how do you think it's possible to, to get to the next level, the metaverse? Well, from our perspective, clearly um, what we have seen is um, that uh, there is some lack of scale. I fully agree to this. And um, from that perspective, for example, we have uh, integrated and bought E plus in Germany in order to get more scale, in order to build a better network and create more and better services for our customers. And this trend has been continued. We see this trend now restarting in Europe again. Let's see how this will play out. But from that perspective, this can't be an excuse while we decide about or design our own digital destiny uh, going forward. So from that perspective, um, we expect that in 10 years we need 20 times the data that we have today if we really enter virtual and augmented reality. So the data volume will explode again in the next 10 years. And for that, clearly, the investments are here. I think mm -hmm. it's not the question of not investing. The willingness to invest is here, I think, is from us and to bring all parties together and to really see the opportunities for the new world because it has never been so cheap to build a real good platform that provides in Europe uh, according to our value services. Two very, very short last questions. One, if we look at um, four US companies, I think they're responsible for 50% of global data traffic. If it's 11 US companies, we have 80% global data traffic. There are calls in the industry to ask for those companies to be, and other companies who sort of use your infrastructure to be charged. Because you know in Germany, we're sort of on first name basis with our dead spots, the Funklöcher at times. So would that help charging the big players who, who use the, um, who, who get the data for free and have the infrastructure for free? I think we should have a fair level playing field. And uh, what we see today is that the distribution of investments that we have on the other side and the profits being made on the infrastructure is not in the appropriate balance. So it's good that this discussion restarted again. 
um, from uh, the European telecommunications industry, and let's see how this pans out. But finally, currently, there's not a clear le fair level playing field, because if we see about the margins and the profits being made, and the level of investments and in capacity increases that we see, there's currently no correlation. Okay, that's rather a yes than a no, I take it. Clearly, we okay. work on that, and um, it needs to be a fair level playing field, as I said. Very last question. If you imagine Steffi, our wonderful host, to be the fairy godmother, who could jinx the EU Commission, who could jinx the, the German government into speed and scale, what would be your wish? Well, if we need scale in Europe, I learned that there are 24 languages in Europe. If we can all speak and understand all European languages, I think that would be a big step forward. Okay, let's start with Bavarian first. Thank you so much for Thank having you. us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.